our message for this morning. It's the first Sunday of the year. So what would be the theme? <laughs> New year, but a renewed commitment. It's a typical kind of message that you would start in the beginning of the year, but it's typical why. Why would there be the need to have a message like this? Anybody? <laughs> because we can drift away, we can begin. Chris himself said, there's times, he says, I have neglected the Word. Watching Netflix or whatever the things he said. Isn't that the case that we find? It's the history that we read about in the, in the Bible the very people of God that He separated and called to be holy would drift away. They would, they would go off into sin. They would prioritize other things in their life. And there was always the need to come back. And, and so, this is a good time of the year to be reminded when people are already thinking, I should make some changes in my life. It's just natural. New year, people think about new things, new commitments, renewed commitments. And I want us to kind of think about that a little bit today. And the, sta the stage has been set in talking about, even in talking about translation projects and, and, uh, and putting the Word first because this is what's important. But the Bible is God's guidebook for His redeemed people. The Bible shows us how to worship, how to serve, and how to obey a holy God. And He's holy. And He's worthy. We just saw it. A response to a holy God is that. Just awe, worship, a desire to seek Him. And so on this first Sunday of the year, I'm going to read a few verses out of a book that sometimes we neglect unless we're doing a Bible reading plan, and maybe that's what you started to do. So you're going to get there before too long, but if you haven't done that, maybe you haven't been in the book of Leviticus for a while, because how many of you know when you talk about the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, is like, Genesis, awesome, amazing history, the creation, Adam, Abraham, the call of God, Joseph, all these great stories, the patriarchs, how the twelve patriarchs came about and all that. Get into Exodus and it's a lot of drama. Amazing history. Movies have been made about it. We learn <coughs> about Moses. And then we hit Leviticus. Numbers. And Deuteronomy. And it's when people who have started Bible reading plans go, <coughs> and they crash and they burn. But we need to have a passion and recognize that Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, they are there for a reason. And they are as much the Word of God as Genesis or Matthew or Ephesians or the book of Revelation. So let's go to a few verses. <clears throat> because as I told you, that the Word um, reveals to us how to worship, serve, and obey a holy God. And that's what... Leviticus is all about. Now, Leviticus follows what? Anybody, can you recite the Bible? Okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. So it follows Exodus. So after Israel has been in slavery for 400 years, and they get out of it, they're delivered, God has something to say to this people. And so, let's look at some of the things he has to say to these people who have been delivered. Because you're delivered out of slavery, but he wants them to be delivered to something. And so Leviticus 19.2, it says, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Oh, pastor, are you kidding me? You're going to put that one on us? Yes! God has called us to be holy, not hip. 
not cool. I am fine with, with, you know, when you see clothing styles, music styles. How, can anybody, Janie, will you help me? Brenda, me, I'm a slightly younger, but I've lived long enough to watch music change. Worship music change in my life of serving God. And with every generation, it seems, that the previous generation struggles with that new music. It is not of God. It's worldly and it's awful. <laughs> it's fast and I don't get it and, and all of the different things. I want to be sensitive to, to aesthetics and style that's appealing, that can draw people in. I'm all for that, without ever compromising. And so some of you that have been around here long enough will remember a major message that I put out, and I never, it's the theme of my life in ministry, my wife's life in ministry. I've seen it in this young man's life in ministry. He's caught it. He's not just been taught it, he's caught it. But it's to be relevant without compromise. I want Journey Church to be relevant, but never at the cost of the Word of God, the will of God, the principles of God. So relevant without compromise. So we're, we may have a, a, a new, you know, the songs we sang, the, you know, a couple of them were newer to us, weren't, weren't they? I don't know about you, but the, the new songs that we're introducing, I'm a fan of. <laughs> but I've always embraced that. I want fresh. The Psalms were new at the time they were written. Some of the hymns of, of uh, uh, you know, and I, I, I don't, I, I've said this for years because I learned it when I was a young Christian and going through this thing, but some of the hymns I understand that we think are the beloved hymns, the sacred hymns, that that's, that's what you're supposed to do in church. You're never supposed to sing anything else. Does, does the Bible say, Sing and make melody in your heart. Um, sing psalms and hymns and praise. And it's not just the psalms, but spirit-inspired new psalm, which is just a song, a poem. Does the Bible say that? Anybody ever have that when you're worshiping the Lord? Well, if you haven't, then ask the Lord for it. You're not a responsive group of people today. Are you wore out from New Year's this late in the week? <laughs> Where's my church? <laughs> what happened to the amens and yes and, and the answer back? <laughs> Everybody's quiet this morning. Maybe because you're hot. I see somebody fanning themselves. So, um, so we're supposed to do that. But what I had been taught, what I had learned, was that some of those sacred hymns that we consider so sacred and holy were set to the, like the, the melody type that you would hear in bars in the day that it was. So the, what's relevant without compromise? Relevance without compromise is that you can, you can have the, the beat or whatever, you know, the music, um, be something that's attractive, without compromising. You don't sing the bar tunes. I remember learning some of those songs as a kid, you know, and they had, you know, drinking, took a drink about an hour ago. How's that one go? I still remember that. And it went right to my head. Anybody remember that? I don't want to sing too much of it because it'll be in your head for the next week. But you sing and you worship with the Word of God. Where He's always glorified. Where Jesus is the example. Our standard is to always be pointing to Him. Not singing about ourselves and, you know, and, and all that, but singing to or about Him. To never let the presentation. I, I'm okay with having it a little warmer. The young people like it. But we're not going to just for the sake of everything, you know, uh, have a presentation that outweighs the message. 
if the presentation doesn't outweigh the message, if the message is in there and Jesus is glorified, I'm cool. There are certain styles that you and I may not like, but the young people do. I've never been a huge fan of rap because I got old, Pam. I probably, you know, in the day would have embraced it, but it must come when the hair turns gray. And I say things like, well, I can't understand all the words in that song. <laughs> One of the reasons why I'm not a big fan of rap, I just, it's just not my thing. I like most every kind of music. But I can tell you, I have heard some Christian rap that has been very anointed. And it's like, whoa, yeah. I heard the words, I understood the words. It was 100% rap, but it honored God. You didn't lose in the presentation and everything to where, you know, it's like, what's the point then? Great example of that would be Pablo in Wilmer, Minnesota. Pablo, uh, I always say Gomez, but it's Gomez, isn't it? Gomez. And a very talented young man on fire for God. And he can, he can lead you <laughs> with rap into the presence of God. That's the key. So, be holy doesn't mean be stodgy, <laughs> be boring, be dated. You know, um, I, 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 we've got to let go of that and just take some of the principles that I'm sharing you with you. It's seek the Lord. You know, it's like, well, if you don't dress this way when you go to church, you're not respecting the awe and the holiness of God. And we, we've had that thing. And that's always been a thing. And I'm always about, does the presentation outweigh the message? You can apply that to anything. Is it about putting God first? Is it honoring God or is it about rebellion? Is it about drawing attention to yourself? In the name of using verses like, I'm free. He has set me free. Whom the Son set free is free indeed. And I can do whatever I want. And you know, and so... When I got saved and I went to a church, um, I got discipled by uh, two individuals and people been around. Again, you know the story. I won't get into it because I don't have time. But uh, two individuals were discipling me. One of them uh, was a perpetual college student. He just kept getting degree after degree because he just loved being a college student. So he kept uh, getting scholarships and everything. And so he'd been in college for not. He didn't have a doctorate degree. He just kept going for the next degree. And you know, and and so. Um, He'd been there probably eight plus years in college. <laughs> he loved it. And so he was all about, you know, him cool. So we would go to church. I, I just was following my leader. But he would wear jeans. And he would not wear socks. Whether he would wear sandals or just shoes, but he wouldn't wear socks. Now that's kind of in style. I see some people with you're not going to ever see me doing this because it would be scary, but skinny, you know, you hear skinny jeans, but they wear skinny suit pants. I don't know if you call them that, but they wear suit pants that are like the skinny jean where it just forms, and it's, and it's cut high over the leg. They used to do that back in Abbott and Costello days. They used to cut that, and you'd see the socks, not just when they sit down. <laughs> and, but they'll do that, and then you can see their ankle. And, and, they, and they don't have socks on, but they have dress shoes on. Um, it's a style. Some of them have unique socks. I don't care about that stuff because it keeps changing. And every generation will go back and say, if you're not doing this, <clears throat> I had a conversation with somebody one time over this kind of thing that, that if you're going to do this, you've got to dress this way and you've got to promote that and you've got to set this stage. And I'm like, okay, where in the Bible does it say to wear a, a suit? And how come it's not a three-piece suit with a hat still? Because just a, gen a generation or two ago, you know, Abbott and Costello days and all. You wore a suit whenever you were being professional and you always wore a hat. And in the day, it was three-piece suits. So when I used to go to church when I was young in the faith, I had three-piece suits, pinstripe suits. And those went out of style. And, you know, and there was the, 
narrow tie, and then there was the wide tie, and there's the, you know, the tie that stopped here for, you know, and then there's the tie that went way down here, and then, you know, everywhere, and the no tie. And it's like, if you're going to go to the standard and say, yeah, but they, they dress this way, then, then go back and find out what the priests wore, and that's what you ought to wear. If you're going to set a standard and say, well, the Bible wants us, because the Bible doesn't say that. <laughs> so I want you in freedom, but with the theme, with holiness, to pursue God, to seek God, <coughs> to have reverential fear and awe for God. And that's when, you know, it's another message, but reverential fear the fear of the Lord is not terror. It's not the Hebrew or Greek word terror. Seek the devil and he may flee. That Greek word is as if in terror. Because they see God in you when you rebuke the, the devil. He sees the Lord and the power of the Lord in you speaking by the Spirit. And he will flee from you. As if in terror. Do you know you scare the devil? Hope and pray that you scare the devil. You are not responsive this year. Okay, everybody go like that. Okay, I know it's silly. Do it. you got to do something. Thank you. I'm serious. You think I'm joking. Do something. Shake around. Get yourselves out of whatever it is that's, that's got you there. Because I want the Word to impact you. I want to I wanna sense... I want to see and sense that you're getting it, that you're responding to it, that something's happening. It, that's, thank you. See, Brother Hagen used to say, begin in the flesh, end in the Spirit. See, if you don't put your, crucify your flesh and put your body under and take authority... And, and you say to yourself, well, I'm just going to wait till the Spirit moves me before I do that. It's not going to happen because you're not yielding to the Spirit. Your flesh is in the way. So start in the Spirit. Anybody that ever listens to Nancy Dufresne, if you've listened to her most recent, she was just talking about how Dr. Dufresne, Ed Dufresne, used to wake up in the morning and they would dance in the Spirit every morning. Just start out doing that, yielding, and then as he's yielding his body to the Lord, God would move. And that's what Brother Hagin would say sometimes. Start in the flesh. I remember that was my own experience with raising my hand. i got to quit saying because it's just taking time. If you've been around for a while, you've heard me say this before. It's okay just to not tell you that, qualify that. See, when I first started out, I still had in the, my human nature, my flesh nature, still to this day, I'm a shy person. <laughs> I know you're thinking, you just went blah, 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 blah in front of us and potentially billions of people on the internet. Um, you're not shy. Uh, that's Christ in me, the hope of glory. That's, you know, my nature is quiet and shy, introverted and reserved, and I was the shyest guy in the world. And um, so when I started going to church and we were singing, um, when I went to a, a spirit-filled church, you know, hands were raised, and I saw it in the Word. I'd, I'd read it even when I was in a church where we didn't do that, but I saw it in there. <laughs> that part of it I kind of like. We didn't even have instruments, but it's like, you know, there's no hands going up and none of that stuff. It just, but even then, I was like, I want the worship part over because I'm so uncomfortable because everybody can hear me. And I really felt like the Truman Show, you know, that everybody's watching. I was like, everybody is watching and hear me in the whole world. It, I, 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 I lived that feeling. The only difference was I was aware. Well, the difference was I was aware that people were watching me, but it wasn't real. He, did, he wasn't aware, and, but they were watching him. So I guess that's the difference. So I felt like I was on that before it was ever made into, I never heard that for years, but that was the way I was, and so I would be awkward. But I saw in the Word, and I saw people 
who I could tell heard from God, they raised their hands. People that I saw God moving in their life, and they were responsive to God, I saw that, and I wanted that experience, but, and I didn't learn this until years after this thought process, but the saying can be summed up, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. <laughs> Where I was going at first, that wasn't happening. Nobody was raising their hand. Nobody was entering in. We sang with no instruments, some songs out of a hymn book, and that was it. No choruses. And then I went, and we had hymn book songs, and we had choruses. Remember the transparency slides? And, and, and the person, had they didn't have all that. They just had to move the slide, and the really gifted one would put paper on there and just you know narrow it down to just the verse so you can concentrate. And, and they're like, wow, they're really good at this. They're anointed. Remember that? You don't remember that if you're young. But we, some of us live that. We still got the transparency projectors in the storage container, two of them. <laughs> yeah. And I was watching, and I saw, and I desired. So I said to myself, I'm going to do what the Word says. I'm going to do what these people who are having an experience with God, hearing from God, encounter with God, they're growing, they're mature, I'm going to do what they're doing. I can see it in the Word, and I can see people of God doing this. And I respect that, and I desire that. So I'm going to follow that example. So even as a brand new young Christian, within the first year of my life, I decided, I went from the one church with no music to a full gospel. That was a total culture shock. Because we had him, but then we had choruses with transparencies, and, you know, and hands were up, and people were clapping. And I know we're like, you know, if you can't clap to the beat, just clap on every beat. If you notice, that's what they're doing in the background. I'm not a to me, I can't do that. I want to be part. I want to be experiencing the song, and so I'll go with the beat. But if you can't do it, be offbeat if you have to. People who are who are <coughs> knowledgeable about it, I, I don't want. I don't mean this to be offensive, but I remember when I was saying, white people clap on the offbeat, and and, and this was a black person saying it, and black people clap in the right. So. And it's weird for us. How many of you hear me clapping and you think, I'm, I, I think you're supposed to clap when you say the word. You're supposed to do that because you're white. You're clapping on the offbeat, but you're supposed to clap on the beat before that <laughs> and say the word. Well, some clap here and some clap there. You're creating the... And that's okay. But Worship! Shake loose those heavy bands. Lift up holy hands. Let everybody praise the Lord. Oh, I'm starting to hear a little response. Maybe we're getting it to shake loose a little. We got to we got to enter in. We want to be different. I don't want what we've always had. I want something different. I don't want to read in the Bible and say, wow, I wish we lived in those days. I wish we lived in the days of the Acts of the Apostle. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> That's the beginning of the workings of the church, but that was just revealing to us what's supposed to still be happening, how God moves, how God works, what God's doing and saying, and, and we need to seek Him and desire that. But we've got to get out of the... I didn't... You know, God's just saying, shake loose the heavy bands today. That's really what I'm getting a whole lot. And it's not your fault because you're, you weren't really responsive. It just, it, it just lets us see. You know, you... We just went through the wearying, tiring, you know, all the energy of the holidays. It gets bigger and bigger, and there's more places we go. My kid, grandkids are not here because they're at a Christmas party, John. They're at a family Christmas party. 
I don't know if it's the fifth one or the sixth one they've done, <laughs> you know, but it, they're at a Christmas party in Branson today, having a wonderful time doing the white elephant gift exchange and all of the fun stuff, eating Christmas, you know, treats and dinners, unwrapping gifts. Maybe we're tired, but I believe God's saying something. When I decided I'm going to do this, I always say it like this, it felt like kind of lifting a weight, you know, like, because <clears throat> remember, I felt like Truman, not, you know, I know he didn't know, but I, it, for me, I was like aware, everyone, not only in that congregation, but the whole world, because I'm so important, the whole world, everybody in that building was looking at me and listening to me, I was stupid, <laughs> but I'm telling you, it was my emotion, it's part of why I was shy reserved. I wanted to be quiet. I wanted to be invisible. But I did it. Tony, when I did, it was, it felt like I'm going against pressure, lifting a weight. But when I did, and I decided I will do it every time, all of a sudden, because I yielded my flesh I recognize he's holy and he's worthy of that. So I'm going to do it no matter what I feel like. It became easy and natural. And now it's weird not to do it. You ever went to a church, you're visiting family or go somewhere and they're worshiping and you just put your hands up and you're the only one? <laughs> What's wrong with and, and you know, People look at you like, what's wrong with you? And you look back at what's wrong with you? I always tell that to teenagers. <clears throat> when you say, I don't want to drink, I don't want to smoke, I don't want to do that drug. Say, what's wrong with you? You go to church? Huh? You, you actually wake up and go to church on Sunday? You go to church on Wednesday? Yeah. You don't? what I tell the teenagers. Turn it around. You, you do drink? When they say, you don't, you don't smoke, you don't cuss, you don't do this, you don't do that. No. You do? I can't believe that. Make it funny, but turn it around. And a boldness will rise up in you and you glorify the Lord. The Holy Spirit is taking over today. <laughs> I had a few verses from Leviticus. But that's okay. Because that's what we want. He's always in charge. Our youth group, we invented something. And uh, we don't have any teenagers in here now. And so it's okay to tell it. Just don't tell them if we do it. But we would do, once a year... A formal dinner at a fast food restaurant. Now I, they didn't know, but I always had a reason for our thunder runs and our formal dinner at the fast food restaurant and different things, you know, Star Trek theme night and different things. There was ob there was reasons because you would not get teenagers to cooperate otherwise or break through in some ways. And this is what this did. So the formal dinner at the fast food restaurant. I'd say, wear a suit and tie. If you got a tux, wear a tux. You want to rent a tux, rent a tux. You got a prom dress, your mom and dad's going to love us because you, you got that prom dress or that homecoming dress and you only wear it one time and they're like, I spent all that money for you to wear it one time and you can say, hey, and you put that on. They're like, who is the youth pastor at that church? Tell them I love them because they just got twice the value out of that because you just put the prom dress or the what was the other one? The homecoming dress on and wore it again. And they loved it. So put the best, fanciest thing you got on and we're going to have a, fast, a, a formal dinner at a fast food restaurant. Teenagers love crazy. It's like, okay. Yeah, we're going to do it. So they're into it. Lisa and I would get china, candelabras. They quit letting us have you know, open flames in the restaurant. We had the you know, candelabras. Now we have the battery ones, which is cool, so we can do it again. But... 
candelabras, we would have silverware. We would go to McDonald's or Hardee's or Taco Bell and take our plate up there and say, I would like it on this plate, please. You know, and they're like, I can't do that. It's like, well, just set the bag on there. And they would carry it back and then we would take it out, put it on there, and we would eat it. And one year, to just give you one example, this repeated itself. But why do you do something like that? Just to be silly? Just to be crazy? Lisa and I don't pastor that way. Not even as youth pastors and children's pastors. We are, we have, we're intentional. We have a purpose. We have a goal. It's the furtherance of people's relationship with the Lord. It's discipling them, helping them. And so these kids, we went to Hardy's one year. And they're decked out, they're dressed up. We fill with our youth group a number of tables. And we're just talking to each other. And you know how it is when you're sitting with booths and things like that. You know, you're sitting sideways and they're sitting sideways in their booth. And so knee to knee. And so we're kind of taking up the aisle. And at Hardy's was where the coolest kids. Remember school? You had the, the preps, the jocks, the hoods, the geeks, and all the different groups. This was the preps. This was the elite. And we took them there. And a couple of ours that wanted to be kind of a part of that. And you know, you know how some of them would be a jock and the, you know, the preppy and all of that. And I was, you know college bound and all that kind of stuff so I'm kind of sports and all that shy I, I, I identified with them I knew what my own thing was I, w- I would hold back and we went in there and they're sitting there and you know and so these preppy kids you know I mean they would have to climb over our knees or you know they would be sitting and so I told, I had two young men who I could see the peer pressure, the cold sweat, the drops starting to form out of the cold sweat. Is it okay if I take a minute or so extra? We did a little longer extra stuff. (laughs) That was a private joke. (laughs) That was funny. Some of you get it. (laughs) So I see this coming on them looked at him and I said you all of this I I mean with purpose and it was by the spirit of God I said you own this not only do not be intimidated but take charge don't be afraid like because they're all looking at you like what are these people doing look at them like why aren't you doing The Spirit of God hit them. And all of a sudden, they grabbed, because we had the lighters to light the candles. <laughs> so they grabbed the lighters. And they started saying, Lean on me when you're not strong. And then they started singing praise. And they just, you know, they, or what was, which one was that? Yeah, Lean on me, because it kind of was implying the Lord. And they were doing, and they sang another one. And they're doing it. So they start walking down the aisles. I'm really stressing Jane out. You know, they're walking down through the aisles. I won't make it that hard for it. Walking, lean on me when you're not. And, and I forget the other one that was more godly after everything I've said today, you know. But this was them. This was their own thing. And they're, they're doing this. They're stepping over the popular kids' knees. And all of a sudden, the whole restaurant, all the preppies, all the popular kids couldn't help themselves because our kids started singing while they're leading doing that. Our kids started, and then all the kids started, and all the people started, and we're just worshiping and praising the Lord. And they impacted the world that night rather than world impacting them. And that was the whole reason why we would do that because it forced them, whether you had that outward experience or just they didn't know it, but I knew that from that day on, even if nothing like that happened, everybody that saw them that went to school with them now knew because... Everyone wanted to know why you're here doing that. 
the managers would come out. They would take pictures of us every year. You know, what do you do? You know, oh, that's so cool. Can I take a picture of you? And, it, you know, it just, it would always have an impact. But when their fellow students, you know, fast food restaurants, there's always somebody. There's no more secret agent Christian. See, now you've been identified. Now you have let your light shine. You didn't know that's what you were there doing, but you let your light shine, and you announced to the other student body, because it's going to go spreading everywhere. You should have seen what we saw. And it motivated them to become witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we would have a vibrant youth group, and new people come in every year as a result of something like that. Intentional, have a purpose, seek the Lord. That doesn't sound like traditional everything you do, but it's powerful. And so I'm challenging you this year, 2024, seek the Lord. He is holy, so be holy. It doesn't mean stuffy and uncool or anything. Make being holy cool again. <laughs> Can we do that? Make being righteous cool again. Make being holy cool again. Um, I'm going to ju jump down. Leviticus 20, 26. And you shall be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy. I have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. See, he knew they came out of slavery and they were going to go in and be tempted to, to worship other gods and do other things and be distracted and even have their freedom and their liberty become, be abused. And so he starts off right off the bat by saying, maintain a relationship with me. Be holy because I'm holy. Prioritize me. How can you do that? By seeking Him. Seeking first the kingdom of God. His righteousness. Read His word. It's His voice. His words. Literally spirit. This is not like other books. This is spiritual. This is a supernatural book. And if you read it, and you commit to reading it every day, you'll, you'll have that. I'm going to jump all the way to the end and give you something as a challenge and send you home. Because I'm going over. I'm not, I want to not make a habit of it. We can have power and do this. But yet, I'm never going to apologize. I'm not going to say I'm sorry that we, you know, if the Spirit of God's moving, I'm going to do it. And if, if it's just unbearable for you, you might want to go to one of those kind of churches that I was talking about before where they don't do the other stuff. I want the move of God. And we're not going to go just to go long, but you get what I'm saying. So let me conclude by giving you the challenge that I wanted to give you anyway, because it's early. We don't want to put it off. Be personal purposeful, mark some time off and, uh, and dedicate yourself to something. In Psalm 77, verse 11 and 12, it says, I remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your works, your wonders of old. I will ponder your work. I will meditate on your mighty deeds. We see he's remembering, he's pondering, thinking about it, you know, um, looking at it, and letting it impact him, and he's meditating on it. He's devoting himself to just really spending some time in that. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Mark some time off to plan three things. Ask yourself these things, and they're questions on the PowerPoint. When will I fit the reading of God's Word into my day? Because this is how you'll seek the Lord effectively. You'll always find the Lord. Well, sometimes when I pray and seek the Lord, I don't sense. He's there. You may not sense it. But just know this. Every time you open this book, He's talking to you. This is the number one way we hear His voice. I am Spirit-filled. God talks to me. He says things directly to my spirit. It's the experience of my life. But this, and it's regular, but this is still the number one way He talks to me. volume -wise. That's the number one way he'll talk to you. You always hear from God. So put the Bible first. Mark off some time today. Okay. I will fit the reading. Will, when will I fit the reading of God's word into my day? What can I change to make it fit? Make a decision. When will you do it? I don't care if you do it in the morning or in the evening or at lunch hour or at work or in the, when you just get off work or just get up earlier and go before work. It doesn't matter. Choose. 
Number two, where at home or work will I read and begin my meditations and prayers? Where can I make some quiet and solitude? <clears throat> so figure that out. Take that, that reading and don't just make it a, just a casual reading, but to meditate on it, to really pray. What do you want to say to me during this? I opened up one of Chris's Bibles because we were looking something up and he was asking me, so I was turning and showing me every page I turned to. And this Bible he just got this summer, every page had notes written all over every page I turned to as I flipped. That's going beyond just reading. That's meditating, committing some time. That comes in what I have witnessed of a commitment to him he does every day. If you want it, you can make it happen. Can I ask you a question? How many of you go to Facebook every day? How many of you spend 10, 15 minutes a day on Facebook or other social media? It's okay to raise your hand. Okay. If anything, if you don't have any other leeway, is that essential to life? That 10 to 15 minutes, if that's all you got, and I know you have others, other things, it's just showing you that there's things in life that we do where we can make time. You might be giving up a favorite show and having that or whatever. And uh, if you want it, you can make it. And lastly, number three, how will I read my Bible this year? Will I read a chapter a day? Will I use a Bible reading plan? Will I use a, a, a devotional that has Scripture in it and do the devotional? I don't care how you're approaching and doing the Scripture or what Bible reading plan or whether it's devotional or chapter a day or what you're doing. Just do something. And seek the Lord. And as you do, you'll experience a holy God. And you're separating yourself, which is what holiness is. Oh, I had some other things I was going to say. for, But I might do this for the whole month of January, some different things with this, so that we can fine-tune those and be specific and intentional about each area.